He revolutionized the way we listen to music, even if it wasn't entirely legal. Sean Parker co-founded Napster in 1999, then went on to become founding president of Facebook, ringleader of tech and music celebrities, including Mark Zuckerberg, Spotify's Daniel Ek, and Snoop Dogg. Justin Timberlake famously portrayed Parker in the movie The Social Network as tech's bad boy, but he's since settled down, married, and devoted his career to political activism and philanthropy, donating millions to support life sciences, global health, and more. Joining me today on Studio 1.0, Napster co-founder, Facebook founding president, and chairman of the Parker Foundation, Sean Parker. And thanks for having us at your pad in LA. Thanks for having me. I want to start by talking a little bit about who you are, how you got here. You started coding when you were seven years old. What kind of a kid were you? I think I was generally a pretty good kid um, up until a certain point when things went a little bit off the rails. What point was that? You know, the, comp the we call it hacking now, which has both positive and negative connotations. But, but you know, this was the computer underground in, in the late 1990s. It was a it was a breeding ground for many people who went on to become successful entrepreneurs, but at the time we were really interested in computer security, and and it had it had a way of sucking you in because there was an element of danger, there was an element of um, there was an intellectual challenge associated with it. And as I became more involved in that world, I became less involved in you know <laughs> my my day-to-day -day life. Everything was probably going fine up until about the age of 14 <laughs> when I discovered this world that, that um, you know, and, and thank goodness I did because if I wouldn't have learned about, I wouldn't have learned to code, I wouldn't have learned about the early internet, I wouldn't have built Napster. So I owe a great debt to that small cabal of people um, who were essentially uh, you know, an underground community of cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, my parents, it drove my parents crazy. When you were 16, you met another hacker, Sean Fanning, online. You didn't go to college, you moved to Silicon Valley, and you guys built Napster together. It was a great experience for us. We had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Little did we know, we, we, there was criminal liability associated with, with, you know, enabling what they called contributory and vicarious copyright infringement on what was realistically an unprecedented scale. I perhaps blame myself only in that I wasn't a better negotiator and I couldn't help them save themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's sad to watch the decline of this industry. Mm -hmm. It didn't necessarily need to happen that way. And, and that, that's a- Why not? Consumers turn to piracy, by and large, when they can't get the product through legitimate channels. So there needed to be a legitimate market offering coming from the record labels, and they couldn't get their act together for years to put that in the market. It was frustrating to watch this long, deleterious collapse of, the indust of an industry that was producing something that I loved so much. That was never our intention. We never wanted to see that happen. Music sales peaked in 1999, and since then, it's been years of decline. You're now on the board of Spotify. Do you think that streaming services can end, end the years of decline that the music industry has been facing. I think we've now turned the corner and we're getting back into growth based on what I've seen at Spotify, based on what I've seen coming out of Apple. It looks like it's bottomed out in terms of, you know, it, for a while, Spotify could replace uh, CD sales, um, the decline in CD sales, and the decline in downloads, but not both. But how do you convince people to pay for services when there's so much available for free online, whether it's YouTube or elsewhere? This question of free versus paid is, is a question that's plagued the music industry all the way back to you know, radio. I would say that the services like Spotify that monetize at a, at a really great rate, where we see you know, users coming in to a free channel, we see at least a third of those users over time becoming paid customers. There's obviously added value, and that added value is 
convenience, it's the ability to make a playlist, share playlists with the outside world, organize your music library. It's all of the things we do to help surface music that you wouldn't have otherwise known about. How does Spotify get over its Taylor Swift problem? But it's not just Taylor Swift. Adele and Coldplay, how does a company like Spotify get over this issue that artists don't want to give their music away for free? Would Spotify consider offering just a paid tier? So, so there's a big difference between artists who these days primarily make their money by touring, by doing ancillary things. They get a certain amount of money from subscription services. Download services aren't doing so well for them these days. They get a little trickle from YouTube, which is really nothing. But the, the branding opportunities, the opportunities to, to stage large-scale tours because the touring industry is so healthy, that, that's the bread and butter for these artists. Now, now, artist management is a different story. I mean, our, artist management, these are, these are people who, and many of them are my friends, so I, you know, I, I shouldn't be, you know, t you know the prof it's a necessary profession. It's a necessary, artists would say it's a necessary evil. But artist managers are always trying to figure out how do we extract every last drop of value from, from this. I, I find it hard to believe that the artists you're mentioning don't want their music to be heard as widely as possible by as many people as possible. I would say their managers would like to extract every last penny from the, from, from the product, which they frankly had no creative role in, in, in producing. But, but you know, their job in the ecosystem is to get, you know, extract every last dime. So you think this is Taylor Swift's manager speaking, not Taylor Swift? I think that's an interesting theory. It's very hard to tell when it's the artist speaking or when it's the manager speaking, and we know that from social media. I don't know what she really thinks. We haven't had a chance to sit down and talk about it. Um, I've talked to a lot of other artists who, whose managers are on a vendetta who love streaming and they just want their music to be heard as widely as possible. What do you think is the biggest threat to Facebook's business? You're known as the guy who dropped the from the Facebook. Um, I know you and Mark were very close. Give me a status update on your relationship with Mark. How often do you still talk? Mark and I don't talk nearly as much as we used to. Mm -hmm. There was a period of time where, uh, you know, we continued to consult every day. But uh, yeah, I mean, generally, generally speaking, it's a it's a good relationship. There's a scene in the Social Network where you and Mark Zuckerberg meet for the first time, and what some people mm -hmm. may not know is after that, I believe. You go hang out with Travis Kalanick, who's now the CEO of Uber. This was before Uber. Is that yes. true? You guys, you guys met up yeah, and you I went to a did. club the, or something. I, I don't know that I went to a club. Actually, actually, Mark, I think, went out to a club. Tell us about you know the Travis Tra Kalanick Travis of, is, of Travis 2004. Is, Travis hasn't really changed at all. I mean, he 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 he's sort of in some ways the perfect CEO of of this company because he enjoys the. He enjoys. He feeds off of the conflict and the and the and the controversy. He he's very good at dealing with complex situations where he you know he's being attacked from all sides. I think there's. I think there's. I think he he would he would thrive as a as a as a you know wartime leader. I mean he he's really? very good. General Kalanick. Uh, under under those circumstances. And uh, you know, I think I think you know, there's a lot of companies that would have been way too boring for for Travis. How impressed are you with what Uber has accomplished? Do you think it's worth sixty two and a half billion dollars? You know, do I think any of these companies are worth uh, the val their private market valuations? I think it's hard to say. There's a disconnect between private company and public company valuations, and the companies wait too long to go public. Uh, and then they don't do so well in the public markets. And there's, uh, you know, you're seeing, you know, you, the fidelity write down, for instance. So there's been a, a large number of high profile write downs. Snapchat, where, Dropbox. Yeah, right, exactly. It's not clear what any of these things are worth um, until the market, the public market values them. Because in these close knit uh, private markets, you know, you can, you can do various things to engineer the valuation. Do you think a company like Uber or Airbnb, should they be going public sooner? The, Traditional path would have been to go public sooner. Something happened post Facebook, and I may have inadvertently played a role in in, in this occurring. 
which was the development of this robust secondary market where where suddenly hedge funds and and private wealth managers and various you know sovereign wealth funds and so forth began to invest very heavily in private companies um, you started that you started the secondary markets I, I didn't I didn't I didn't start everything I certainly didn't start I certainly didn't start secondary markets but but we we encouraged at Facebook a robust secondary market we were much more open to to having a secondary market and be, in part because we had a longer term vision and you need to give people an opportunity to take liquidity along the way what do you think is the biggest threat to Facebook's business? You know, I think Facebook's business is, has so much growth left in it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, so it, it's really value extraction. It's value that's been stored for a long time, and then there's a lot of very smart people trying to figure out how do we unlock that value. Um, that process is, you know, another 10 or 20 years before we, we, we start to see we start to see what that looks like. How big a threat do you think Snapchat is to Facebook. There's never been one uh, communication network that dominated everything. They, you know, they all serve slightly different purposes to, to different people. I think Mark Zuckerberg has done a wonderful job, and I applaud his ability to understand which companies genuinely pose a threat and an opportunity you, you know, to, to Facebook. The interesting question is, how does Snapchat iterate into becoming more of a communication platform that enables, you know, communication that's not necessarily ephemeral? So you think they should work on non-ephemeral I, I, I just think, you know, there's indication that they're going in that direction. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't spend that much time thinking about it. So whether it's Instagram or Oculus or WhatsApp or Messenger or Internet.org, which of those do you see as having the most potential to become the next huge business for Facebook. The interesting question for Facebook is, you know, is that next big thing uh, somewhere else entirely? Is it, is it, you know, is it, is it Google X and life sciences and, you know, contact lenses that measure glucose? Is it self-driving cars or is it going to be something that's very close to the home, you know, the, 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 the core of what Facebook is? Um, Do you think Facebook should move beyond the core? I think that communication is the biggest market in the world. Mm -hmm. Communication cannot be undervalued. So, so are there a lot of other communication paradigms and are there a lot of other um, ways of communicating that Facebook could enable? You know, does it make sense for Facebook to buy something like Snapchat? Does it make sense for, for Facebook to um, you know, expand more into real-time communication? So not just broadcast-based you know, where you're sharing with a group, it's essentially public. Facebook Messenger is is really no different from instant messaging, which we've had since, you know, the uh, really the mid-1990s, or actually going all the way back to IRC and the early internet. Facebook is very good at understanding the, the core communication network apps that they should own. Mm -hmm. And are there more of those out there? Absolutely. There are, there are enormous opportunities left in communication. You mean enormous opportunities left in terms of what Facebook could buy? Well, in terms of what Facebook could build or buy. So do you think Facebook should consider buying Snapchat again? You know, I, I think it's inter it'll be interesting to see where Snapchat takes their user base. And a great analogy is when Facebook launched Feed. Feed created a paradigm that's almost too ubiquitous, where every company thinks they need to have a feed. Could Snapchat undergo a similar transition where they move away from having, um, you know, everything's ephemeral, messages are destructive? You know, that's a possibility. I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't, I don't know Evan, uh, but but I but I wonder um, about where they where they could take things. Twitter. Do you think Twitter survives? I think Twitter is a victim of their own success in so many ways. They are a company that, had it not been for um, the media's infatuation with Twitter, uh, Twitter never would have built an enormous user base. Um, but that came at a cost. And the cost was the lack of deep, you know, close-knit community between its users. Um, Twitter was never uh, an accurate reflection of your real social network. It, did, it didn't have the same level of intimate interaction. I don't think Twitter would have existed had it not been for its 
its relationship with celebrity and media. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, I think its relationship with celebrity and media is its biggest weakness. Really? So how does that play out? I mean, does, does Twitter survive this, the next wave of I mean, innovation I, in social networking? I, I, the, the, the question of does it survive is maybe too, too dramatic of a question. I, 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 it's, a, it's a question of do they prosper and do they become you know, a much larger company um, or do they remain roughly the same size and, and they become a, um, you know, a, 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 par, a part of our lives in a, in a, in a, in a fairly narrow way? You know, I, I don't think that Twitter goes on to, to take market share from, from other, other players. Um, and I think that, but I do think that they will continue to exist. There's a huge debate between privacy versus security. Should the tech industry be more accommodating to the government? There's a huge debate between privacy versus security and how much Silicon Valley can help with that. And Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook have really put a stake in the ground saying, we're not gonna help the government spy on our users. Should the tech industry be more accommodating to what to the government? The reality of the relationship between um, large industry and government, um, you know, should not be underestimated. Of course, there is collaboration. To think that uh, communication companies, network providers, social media uh, companies aren't, you know, cooperating with the federal government in various ways, I think is naive. We're living in a world where enormous economic value comes from, from finding connections. Like, I, I never would have met Mark Zuckerberg if it hadn't been for the internet. I never would have met Sean Fanning. Mm -hmm. I, we met in an underground chat room. We, we met in a place that would probably be monitored right now by the government because they're, you know, they're very suspicious of hackers. So, but had it not been for that ability to communicate and that freedom to communicate, you know, we never would have met each other. None of this would have happened. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be having this conversation. I, I think that, the, that, you know, by that same token, the, the more accessible and available these communication technologies are, and the more accessible and available encryption technologies are, you know, th these, these tools are gonna be used to foment necessary revolutions against dictators, and they will be used by terrorists, you know, by the, by the, the, the nine crazies who never otherwise would have met to organize into a homegrown terrorist cell. Every uh, major technological platform, every major shift that happens in the way we communicate you know, is a double-edged sword. So uh, what, what's your current act? What are you spending most of your time on right now? It's about 50% uh, venture investing, uh, you know, startups, you know, many of which have been ongoing for several years, and about 50% philanthropic endeavors, most of which is life sciences related. What did you think about the Chan Zuckerberg initiative? It's been unexpectedly controversial, criticized for not giving to charity, characterizing it as an LLC. Was that unfair? I don't think anything Mark does should, uh, we shouldn't expect it to be anything other than controversial. His intentions are entirely altruistic. It's very hard to criticize someone who, who's saying they're gonna give away the vast, vast majority, 99% of their, of their fortune. Um, I think that the goal of saying it the way he said it and laying it out the way he explained it was to spark controversy. The media cycle is dominated by Donald Trump and terrorism and, you know, a, a lot of really scary things. I think Mark felt an obligation to create a conversation um, around uh, the role of someone who has vast resources uh, to try to reshape the world. And I think he succeeded in doing that. You founded the Parker Foundation. You're giving away $600 million to life sciences, global health, civic engagement. How has your own strategy evolved? The, the Parker Foundation is, is doing things 
that we feel extremely passionate about that we feel need to get done in the world. And the reason you're seeing so much of, of this kind of you know, new um, hacker style philanthropy um, is because this group of people who, you know, they made their money by being disruptive, they made their money by being unconventional. There's a desire, uh, you know, to see the same type of impact that they've had in their business career, which has been, you know, if you look at Uber, for instance, it's been massively disruptive. How, how does one find opportunities that are equally disruptive um, in, the, in the philanthropic world, uh, but they're, but they're, you know, they're, they're the, the type of disruption that has to happen if these entrenched social problems are going to be addressed. So you're giving money to advance science. You're focusing on allergies, cancer. What do you think that you can do differently than traditional venture capitalists? I think philanthropy can get ahead of venture capital. So venture, venture capital, when it's done correctly, happens at a time when a business is ready for commercialization. It's not there to fund basic science. And I think there's this middle ground where, for instance, cancer immunotherapy. If you're gonna fund immunotherapy, um, you're gonna be taking money away from existing labs and existing researchers that have been built up over time. And there's a, there's a, there's a hesitation there. The breakthroughs have happened very quickly, but they've been driven by private philanthropy because governments have been too slow um, to recognize that a technology is ready for, you know, you know, investment, mm -hmm. and, and whether that's ph philanthropic investment or venture investment. Any crazy areas in, in biotech that you're, you're, you're thinking about funding that we don't know about yet? I think pharma has done a really poor job of understanding um, where past drugs that have been, you know, demonstrated safe in phase one and phase two clinical trials, um, you know, could have been approved mm -hmm. in a much narrower uh, indication. But it may mean that you know you need access to a drug that only 300 other people need access to. Mm -hmm. You know we we don't have a regulatory framework today that's very good at getting those drugs to market. So, what's next for Sean Parker? I mean, I, th I think life sciences is the single most interesting area of exploration. It's it it is to the world today what social media was to me in 2002, three, and four. The ability to, you know, getting to lab on chip. Uh, in so many cases where it's easy for a grad student to do something that someone would have spent 30 years of their life trying to do previously. Mm -hmm. But I do think that cost reductions um, uh, be because of uh, new technology leading to faster and faster progress um, are like an enormous opportunity. I think the fundamental question of the 21st century is how do we make sure that the technological innovations coming out of life sciences are available to everyone. Sean Parker, thank you so much for joining us today on Studio 1.0. Thank you for having us at your fabulous house. It's been great to have you. Thank you.